Hello, everyone. My name is Yulia, and I'm on the communications team of the Guild. And I'm really excited to have Andrew Gibbons with me. He's a really well-known practitioner, assistant trainer. Um, he's based in Manhattan and has over 20 ex years of experience as a Feldenkrais practitioner. And I've taken some of his classes um, with great delight. And I think I could um, bravely call him a functional anatomist. I hope Andrew agrees with me. <laughs> um, and today we're here to speak about Feldenkrais method and fitness. Um, so welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Julia. Yeah. Um, so my first question is a simple one. What does it mean to be fit to you, to you as a Feldenkrais practitioner, to you as a former musician? Um, what does it mean for you personally? Well, for me, I, I think I'm, I'm not that special. I think I'm like m most people in life who are, um, you know, my goals aren't to run a marathon or to climb the highest mountain. Um, I just wanted to do the things in my life that gave me the most pleasure or that I was the most interested in. And I, I found out about my own levels of fitness, usually through injury. That's usually the way that I think a lot of people encounter uh, that realm for themselves. Um, so to me, being, being fit uh, often meant learning to overcome my own limitations. And that meant also what I didn't understand about how to move and how to use my attention in a skillful way. Um, and also setting a realistic timeline and goals for how I was going to improve and how I was going to um, get past the, the difficulties. And for me, the Feldenkrais method was a big part of how I did that. Obviously, I became a, a professional uh, Feldenkrais teacher, a movement teacher. And so um, for me, uh, also just being fit uh, means something similar that it means to, to most people also, which means I want to be able to take pleasure in moving. Um, I want to be able to take pleasure in exerting myself. If I want to go for a run, if my kids want to play a, you know, a father-son soccer game, or um, I, I, I want to enjoy the process of having to do a little work in my yard and having to lift a bag of fertilizer and carry, I don't want that to be a, a major awful event and something that causes a big up emotional upheaval because I can't get this thing across the yard or whatever. You know, I want to feel vital just like everybody else does, you know. And are you... Am I vital? Are you feeling vital now? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say I'm, uh, you know, compared to the, you know, whatever my self-reported levels of, of fitness were 20 years ago, I think I'm in a lot better physically fit shape than I've ever been in my life. Um, and that is both a combination of my, my practice uh, as a Feldenkrais teacher, just the work I do on myself using uh, awareness through movement, uh, the, the, the group lessons, I, I study those myself. But it also comes from taking that practice and also scaling it. It, it needs to scale into, into the activities where you're actually lifting more weight or you are exerting yourself more. Um, you know, the benefits that come from exercise or from lifting weight, um, those benefits only come through the exertion, right? You don't get the benefits of exercise without the exertion. You can't sit on a couch and think about or philosophize about exercise and get the benefits of exercise. That is not going to happen. So it's important to understand that the, the exertion actually is the way you get the benefits. But the, of course, the initial obstacle for, for most people who are either beginning their journey to become more fit or they're not, they know they're not fit and they're trying to decide what avenues they're going to take, the most basic form of assessment is well, how can I understand myself and the way that my body works so that I'm not breaking myself down further in the very activity that I'm wanting to do to build myself up? And this is really a caveat that is in a lot of activities. Yes, to get stronger, lifting weights will help you get stronger, but it's also possible to injure yourself while you're lifting weights. And the difference between the person that, that gets stronger and the person that gets injured, um, there's often a couple of factors. One might be uh, just how good they already are in their body. Did they grow up 
playing sports and they have a lot of experience moving and they, they kind of have a, an intuitive sense already built in. Uh, secondly, are they injured in some way before they start, right? If, if you have a knee problem, there are probably going to be certain ways that you're going to have to work around that problem as you, as you become more physically fit. Um, and then third is just your level of ignorance because most injuries, whether they, they occur in a, like a single moment where you, you trip and you take a bad spill and you brace yourself and you didn't see that that step had a, had a brick missing or, you know, whatever it was, I don't mean to say ignorance, like it's a, uh, a bad judgment. We're all ignorant of, of some portion of our, our lives, but whether it happens in a, a brief moment like that, where you're a single traumatic event, or it's coming from a, a sort of a, a long-term habit that's corrosive, the way you walk, the way you stand, the way you sit. Um, most injuries are built out of some combination of ignorance combined with effort. Um, anybody that's ever been to the gym, even if you're not a frequent gym goer, I was not a frequent gym goer. My, my experience in my, you know, let's say the first half of my life was I was a musician. So lifting weights, it never really felt like this is the best thing for me to do for my hands. They, oh, they always felt kind of tight afterwards. And I, I didn't like that. And, you know, that's not a, that's not an educated opinion. That's just my own little personal uh, feeling of it. But I would go to the gym and then frequently I would, I would kind of ding some, I would li try to lift, but I wasn't very good at it. And, and I would notice that, that that didn't feel very good. I don't feel stronger after that experience. I felt like I kind of hurt myself. And yeah, there was, it, it's not just, it's not the opinion that weights are bad after that. I think that the, the best thing to, to realize is I don't understand something. I don't understand something maybe about the, the form or the technique of the way I'm lifting the weight. And I may not understand something about the way I'm using myself when I sit. I may be sitting on the, the machine or the, I may be sitting underneath the bar in a particular way that predisposes me to have that feeling in my shoulder. And so um, to me, in terms of becoming more and more fit and wanting your, your abilities to scale, right? That's the long-term project. You want your abilities to scale gradually and you wanna feel safe as they scale. That's, to me, that's the gold standard. Um, to do that, you have to take on the project of understanding what you don't understand. What are my blind spots? How can I have the experience of running around the block a little bit and then thinking, well, how did I do? Oh, my knee feels horrible after that. Oh, well, here's a decision point. Should I now run two more blocks? Maybe not. Maybe I should walk for the next, you know, 15 minutes or five minutes or whatever it is. These are the kinds of, you know, psychological calisthenics that go on with people that as they start a, some sort of a fitness regime. And it's important to be able to reflect uh, with yourself right? Or with, with somebody else, if you're working with a coach or a teacher, a Feldenkrais teacher or something, it's important to have a context where you can not only take action, but also reflect on the actions you've taken so that you're, you're really navigating responsibly through the experience. Yeah. So you're basically saying that any, probably like anything in life, fitness should be a learning activity, right? So you're talking about learning really as a key component of this. Yeah. And, and what does learning mean, right? Learning probably means that as you get better at something, there are new layers of things to understand, right? Because most people are, um, most people are hoping, right? There's a big, there's a, there's a, there's a secret aspirational hope that I will go to the gym, I will get on the rowing machine or whatever it is, and, and I will do it and I will feel good. Like the exertion will feel vitalizing or I will feel good about myself, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you have, to, you have to take stock each time you go because the fitness activity is not, it's not just that the activity is, is beneficial. It is beneficial under certain circumstances and you have to understand those circumstances so that the, the activity of, of doing your run or going to the gym or whatever it may be, that activity is hopefully also, it's a point of orientation in your day and in your life long-term. Like when, when I go to, you know, I, I took a, during the pandemic, I started taking Tai Chi classes online, found an instructor, researched him a little bit, liked what I saw. I started doing it every morning. It was quite difficult, right? But it was a very different vocabulary than I was used to. Some of the movements were quite challenging, but I also liked it a lot. But 
doing it every day allows me to feel essentially, well, how, or it allows me to ask myself, how am I doing today? Some days I felt like, ugh, this is actually getting harder. This is harder than it was yesterday. What, what's, what's happened? Oh, did I not sleep enough the night before, et cetera, et cetera. Other days I felt like, oh, I'm starting to get the hang of this. I can actually feel the quality of my stance or the, the quality of my breath through the movement. And so I'm measuring how I'm doing. The, the consistency with which I do these things is a big part of just knowing how I'm doing in life, right? I'm not going to be a I'm not going to go into a Tai Chi competition or it's not, I'm not seeking to, to, there's, there's no other larger goal to, to develop myself for, for combat or something like this, but I want to make it useful for my, for my day-to-day -day experience, you know? Yeah, that's great. Um, one question that comes to mind um, as I listen to you, what often when I teach group classes, um, I feel that judgment comes, um, it's like a big barrier and improvement um, for my students. And I feel it's almost the same with fitness and getting strong. Uh, and I, you know, I still struggle with that personally where I have to give myself permission to skip a workout or, or not, not to feel um, almost like obligated because in, in the society we feel obligated that we have to work mm -hmm. out. Right. Uh, and so, you know, how do you work with um, clients and, and yourself in that way, um, creating a kind of less judgment? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the difficult thing is, of course, we are going to judge the situation. That is, that is, I don't know if that's unavoidable or not. The question is whether the judgment is really in itself just sort of a compulsive uh, negative or kind of a corrosive effect. The judgment is a good thing, right? Judgment allows me to detect whether the way I feel on my knee this morning, that should I go for a run this morning? Or is this one of the days that I back off and I walk a little bit more? So I don't think judgment in itself necessarily has to be a bad thing. But in terms of what I think you're, you're getting at, which is the way that people tend to feel a little dissatisfied with themselves, almost under any circumstance you put them in. There, there's a way in which no matter whether they go to an aerobics class or a yoga class or a Feldenkrais class or a Tai Chi class or a, a running clinic or, or whatever you like, people are measuring themselves and they're usually measuring themselves against other people that they see around them or maybe in the media, you know, certainly the fitness industry. What are you looking at in the fitness industry? You're looking at a lot of people who spend a lot of time getting in really beautiful shape and then you look at yourself in the mirror and you think, wow, there's a big difference between me and this, this person I see on the, in the ad, right? Th this is pretty standard. And I think for most people, they should just recognize the silliness of it, that we all do it. And to really then embrace the project of asking yourself, well, Andrew, what do you want? For forget about the, the, the very, the, the, low, <laughs> the low body fat model you see on page 44. What do you want for your life? Now, that's a very broad question, but the point is to get the person to, to start to make more realistic and compassionate uh, expectations of themselves. And that, and that doing that and being able to reflect on that with, with a, either a partner or, like I said, a teacher or a coach, that's really what you pay a good Feldenkrais teacher for. Part of what you're paying them for is also the ability to help you reflect positively on what you are learning, how the resources that you do have available in yourself, they, they are good enough and, and they need to be good enough. You need to start trusting your resources and you need to put yourself in a, in a consistent context where you can scale, you can build, you can refine, and you can do it in a safe way. I think that's what that's what a really good uh, relationship with a teacher uh, looks like. You're not looking to sign up for some guru or some somebody to just fix all your problems. That that's probably not a that's not a good relationship to to assume that you're that you're in. You want someone to help you be both uh, appreciative of your own creativity and your abilities, and to help you learn how to access them regularly. Because all these things, no matter what what our project is, if our project is I just don't want to have pain with my knee. That's that's a great project. That's that's probably the project you should be engaged in before you go into the the fitness realm or the gym or whatever it is. 
you, you want that that project to really move in the direction of things getting better and better. And the more consistently you're engaged with looking into that, usually the better it goes. You know, if you if you only look at your finances once every five years, chances are you're not getting a, you're not getting a frequent enough access into <laughs> how, how the markets are going or what you know what your you know how much debt you have left on your house or whatever it is. That's not frequent enough for that to be useful to you. And so, just the, the same way that people look at uh, diet, for instance, if if your diet is horrible and you're 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 wishing to get uh, to lose weight or to become more healthy. You know, diet is extremely important to look into, but if you eat one stalk of broccoli and then you run to the scale, well, <laughs> slow down. This project, you know, it's time to get more realistic about the the time the time scale that that the changes take place over. And once a person can sink into that a little more uh, pleasantly and realize, oh, this is that's why the the phrase like it's a lifestyle, right? whatever that phrase sounds like to people, the point is it often takes longer than you expect. The, the, the engine of expectation that you have inside of yourself, that also needs to calm down. You, you're not going to go to the gym and lift, you know, have one day where you just, you know, exert a lot of weight. That, that is not going to get you fit. And also it's, it's silly to expect, it's silly to expect that. You want to have this sort of longer range thinking um, you want to play the long game with these things. That's what that's what elevates your life in a more consistent way, and and hopefully, it allows you to find a way to enjoy yourself while you're doing it. And that's that's really important because a lot of people the the misalignment of your expectations with with what you're doing that's how people that's part of the experience of frustration, the experience of boredom, like they they're bored by exercise, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's, it just takes a little bit more of a, of a long range attitude. And, th and then there's a benefit to having more time because again, you can plan, you can strategize, you can adjust, you can adapt to the situation a little bit better and you can get creative. And that in itself is often a very enjoyable experience to have. Yeah, and I think it gets boring when there's no learning, right? When you're repeating the same thing over and over mm -hmm. and there's no scaling up like you, you said before. Yeah, the I mean, the 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 nice thing about what we do for a living, I, I one of the nice things about the Feldenkrais method, is that you you actually learn to take pleasure in your experience of movement. You actually learn that there is pleasure to be taken. I think for a large segment of the population, everybody wants the benefits of getting fit or of you know whatever their project or you know certainly everybody wants the benefit of not having their back hurt and not having pain in the neck or whatever it might be. But the process of learning and, and acquiring the behaviors and the, the attitudes that help you get there, that process, it takes some time, but there's also a way to make that process actually enjoyable. And for people that are in a hurry to get fit or in a hurry to get the pain away from the knee, so they're going to just take a lot of this uh, supplement or that, you know, they, they're, they're rushing for the quick fix. Um, Again, the misalignment of your expectations and, and what, what other resources you might, you might use, that, that's what leads to those experiences. Boredom is simply the inability to pay attention. There's a lot of very useful things to learn to pay attention to when you are exercising, not just when you're in a Feldenkrais class. I mean, it can feel, you know, the, the container of awareness through movement and the Feldenkrais method sometimes. It can feel like, wow, this is a very special container. Here, here I am in this in this class where I'm the the caliber of my attention is suddenly much larger. Wow, I didn't I didn't realize that expanding my sense of what I pay attention to when I move or or concentrate can have such a, a positive effect. And then the problem is that the person may end up thinking. I can only pay attention that way in that class, right? <laughs> and that that's a perfect example of of no, 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 we want, we want that resource that you just found that nobody just gave that to you. That's, that's already in you. You're just learning to access it. That's a moment where a, a very useful conversation can take place because what you don't want is the person to say, oh, well, awareness or movement is fantastic. I pay attention in such a great way. And then they go for a run or they go to the gym 
and they just return to a complete ignorant disaster. They go back to just this, this crazy cross-motivated way of using themselves. And it's like, no, 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 think about what you just learned in the class and, and bring that in to the, to the, the, performance, uh, the performance context. And for a lot of people, again, that project of scaling what they learned in the class, bringing that quality of attention in to other activities, generalizing what they learned, that also takes some time. That also can take some skilled um, training with a Feldenkrais teacher. It's not just what you do. There's also the conversations, the context, the reflection around what you're doing that then allow you to enter those other activities more skillfully and, and to be creative in those activities too, right? Yeah, and talking about this relationship of a teacher and a student, um, I know in your practice, you've coached some professional athletes. So I'm curious. Uh, just, to a hear few, if, just a few. Just, well, what, yeah. if you had experiences working with, you know, athletic performance, right? Because sometimes people kind of have difficulty reconciling this slow, you know, soft approach of Feldenkrais with kind of the hardness of sports, professional sports. How, how would you talk about that? That kind of reconciling the two and what can Feldenkrais method um, offer to the professional athletes? Well, there's a big difference between going to get just a, whatever it means, a typical private session with a Feldenkrais teacher. There's a big difference between that and actually paying a teacher to actually help you scale those gains into your sport or your performing art or whatever it is, because that involves more time and attention. That, that involves usually the teacher accompanying the athlete into the gym, onto the soccer field, onto the hockey rink. I mean, I would never put on skates with a, I, it would just be, I, I can't, I mean, I can skate, the, 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 I can skate the way a four-year-old probably skates. <laughs> but in other words, you would want that conversation to also continue into the levels of exertion that get them closer to the actual performance level, right? And there's, of course, there, there has to be a reasonable conversation about what the Feldenkrais teacher is offering, is skilled at. I'm not a professional hockey player, right? I'm not going to teach you the, I'm not going to tell you some secret strategy about how to play hockey better than your, than your, your, your hockey defense coach who's had 20 years in the HNL, or NHL, right? My expertise, it lies in a particular arena. But the, the smart athletes understand that what they're getting with a really qualified Feldenkrais teacher who understands that stuff is that there's an honest conversation between them. They're not imagining that, oh, they did this particular lesson. So that means they should be able now to just skate on this knee that's, that's not quite there yet. You, you want to be able to work within the realm of both possibility, but you also want to, you want to play really good sort of defense in the way you scale into the athletic arena because the athletic arena is chaotic. It's not controlled. There are rules to the game, yes, but those guys are moving around at high speed. Sometimes there, there's collisions like in football and, and hockey and rugby and things like that. There's, there's, you don't want to imagine that those collisions, that you're somehow going to be protected from, you, know, you, don't have, you don't have unrealistic expectations. I think where we're really useful is in the, with the player that really takes very, very seriously this gradual scaling up of their abilities. And so that they're using their creativity differently too. It's not just the kinds of movements that we teach in the lessons. It's also the way we teach the use of attention. And that's something that's really attractive to a lot of athletes. It, it's, it's no longer a big secret or something esoteric in the athletic community now to understand that the way you use your attention, your cognitive skills, that those, those internal and external attentive dynamics that are part of the sport, those are often what make the huge difference, right? Because especially with professional athletes, you know, on, on the swim team, everybody's body is pretty much the same on the Olympic level. If you ever watched Olympic sports, right? All of the wrestlers, they look the same. They have the long spines and the shorter legs. All the hurdlers have the same body because at that level, what nature provided you is really, really important. You can't just outwork I mean, yes, there are anomalies. There's the spud webs of the NBA who are, who are not even six feet tall, but could dunk, but there's only one of those guys, right? 
most of the people at the high end of the performance spectrum, they have the kind of body already that you need to do well in that sport. And so the big place where a lot of improvements can be made is in how they approach and, and how they use their awareness and their, their cognitive abilities in the way that they train. Yeah. And for a lot of the pros, they are very interested in measuring how good they're getting. They're not, they're not just sort of, hey, I, I kind of feel okay today. Gee, you know, they got a lot of people measuring how well they're doing. They do a lot of repetitive tasks because they're trying to, they're trying to narrow their skill set for that particular sport. And so they're 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 very sensitive in a positive way to things that feel better. When something feels better, when they when their back moves better and they're able to swing the racket that much clearer, they do not fail to notice this. Yeah. Cuz they they've built their life around paying attention to those details in that context. So, so in a way they give you immediate <laughs> feedback in terms of how effective you are as a coach. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they'll tell I mean, they, they're used to being coached too. Some of them are, they're, they're, they've been coached to death. You know, they, it's like they've, all, they've, they've constantly had people telling them what to do. And that can be another form of challenge too, is to get them to just personally take on their own assessment of, of where they are and, and how they're feeling and that sort of thing. And of course, the more people you have in your head, the more coaches you've had, et cetera, and your relationships with them, the more you have this, this new person giving you this, this new piece of information, this new experience, and then they're measuring it against what coach X told them or what coach Y told them. You can run into these kinds of issues too. So it's not simple. It's not simple. But I, I'd say it's very important that the, the Feldenkrais teacher and the person they're working with, that they're clear about what they, what they can offer, right? That you don't, I, I don't want someone believing that I'm some great athlete and that that's why they're working with me. It's not, I'm not a great athlete and that's not why they're working with me. My layer of expertise is happening at a much more foundational layer. And it's often related to some, something that's making them way more uncomfortable than they need to be in, in the sport that they, that they love so much. So yeah, you know, once that honest conversation happens, then then some pretty th then their resources really can come online, and and hopefully what you're doing is you're shortening the amount of time it takes for them to get back to playing, or you're helping them elevate their skill set and refine it in a way that they never considered before. You know. Thank you. That's really yeah. interesting. Um, well, to wrap up our conversation, I actually wanted to ask you. I know, you know, many people, when I work with them, they ask me, so what, you know, what, what is it that I should do? Should I swim? Should I run? Should I walk? <laughs> so from the Feldenkrais perspective, what do you think are the kind of the most healthful fitness um, routines or sports? You know, you mentioned weights, right? And I, I assume that it's not just weights, but, you know, functional kind of full body use of weights or at least that's how I understand it. Um, yeah, but I mean, the thing is, at, at, you know, people should read the research out there because one of the things that's, a lot of this stuff is now known, right? One of the biggest things you need as you grow older, because as you get older, sarcopenia or the loss of the, the muscle, certain kinds of muscle fibers, and, and it's a loss of physical strength. Weight training is a big part of what keeps that away. Your, your, your ability to maintain your physical strength. I mean, again, everybody's life is, is slowly going like this, right? Some people, it will drop off a cliff at a certain point, but we're trying to smooth and control and be really to be oriented in the slope as it, that. as it passes. That's, I would like to go. Well, like there, of course, there are times in your life. If again, if you, if you, I've had clients, you know, I've had, I've had clients in their, in their teens. I've had clients all the way into their nineties, right? Now, somebody who's 90, if they suffer a big setback, they're not going to bounce back in the way that they did in their 50s, right? That's, that's, not, that's not a doom and gloom. That's just being realistic, right? Now, I've had a couple of clients say to me over the years, like, oh, I should have met you 20 years ago. And that's, that's true because in, in the later decades, the gains you can make, the, the amount you can shape the curve that way is limited. It is. But it doesn't mean it's not a worthy project, right? Because it's, it's partially also the ability to stay oriented. One of the, I've, I've told this story before, but 
you know, over, over the, you know, the years that I've, I've been a teacher, I have worked with people who were coming to me at the point in their life when they were losing the ability to walk. And I don't mean they were just noticing something. I mean, they were, they were weeks or months or days from needing a wheelchair all the time. And that is not a pleasant moment in a person's life. It's not. It's probably inevitable for most of us, depending on how long we live. But I think one of the most negative experiences that those people were having was around the confusion that they had, the moment of like, why is this going away? Why is this ability disappearing? I mean, of course, people can assume, well, I'm, I guess I'm older, but the physical loss of that ability uh, for some people is just like, I don't understand why, uh, and I should be able to, and, and this just creates more stress. The, the intelligent choice is, it's, in, it's 20 years ago, it's to learn how walking works. It's to be able to refine your walking, to heal the injuries you have now, so that you not only functionally, you're better for longer and your, your good years are the, they're, they're good for longer, but you also understand how walking works. You, you actually know something so that as you're getting older, you're actually noticing the moments when things are, are you know how to collect yourself and improve and, and, and scale your, your abilities at that moment, you're not going to sit down for two years. I have had clients who they, they were in bed for a year and that, and they imagine that now that they're, they're better or circumstances have changed, they're going to, that's a huge hit to take physiologically and neurologically, frankly. Right. So we, we want to have goals for ourselves. And the trick is to have those goals to play the, to long, the long game so that the refinements you make, the insights you have, the practice that you put in, it's these practices are like pennies in the bank, pennies in the bank, pennies in the bank. And it just slowly, hopefully pays off in how smooth the slope is. And also your ability to stay hopefully in control and you're oriented in how you're, how you're doing in your life. That's a very, very important and positive part of what it means to be fit and what it means to be healthy. Yeah, because it also helps you justify going to the gym. Not, not everybody loves going to the gym. There are days I don't, I don't love going for a run. I don't love going to lift weights. That's not why I'm doing that activity necessarily. But I have, I have sat down and thought about it. And so I have my reasons. And, that, and then of course my skills as a, from what I've learned in the Feldenkrais method, they actually help me uh, not hate it when I do it. I know what I can pay attention to, what I can enjoy. You know, the, the challenge aspect can be really fun, so. Wow, this is fascinating. I think everyone will be excited to listen to this. Thank you so much, Andrew. It was You're very welcome. Thank you for the time and thank you for the questions.